You're weeping for lost souls. Hey, God is going to bless you. You're going to get somebody saved, and you're going to bring that sheave with you. You're going to be rejoicing one day uh, with the, the convert that you bring to church, that you want to the Lord. Okay? Now, that's the truth. Amen and amen. But does it really necessarily say that the weeping is because you're weeping for lost souls? Necessarily? Not really. Okay, and if you study the, even if you study the chapter, it's talking about them being in captivity and bondage and suffering in their life. And let me put forth to you that maybe if you go forth and maybe you're weeping about something else. I mean, maybe you're weeping because your finances are down the toilet. Maybe you're weeping because your marriage is on the rocks. Maybe you're weeping because your kids have gone astray. Or maybe you're weeping because uh, you're in physical pain. Maybe you're weeping because of physical pain that's in your body. But God says, hey, if you go anyway, you're going to come again with rejoicing, bringing your seed with you. He said, no matter what you're weeping on in your life, you want to have joy in your life. It's just pick yourself up and say, I know I'm, I'm sad. I mean, I'm, I'm weary. I'm tired. I'm in pain. I'm struggling. But I'm going to go forth. Yes, I'm weeping. But I'm going to go forth and bear that precious seed. I'm going to preach the gospel. And you know what? I believe that God will give you joy in your heart no matter what you're going through. I mean, you could be in physical pain. You go out and win somebody to Christ, bring that sheep with you. You're going to have some rejoicing. I mean, it doesn't matter what situation you're in, you're going to come with joy again. And, you know, I just never heard that aspect of this preached. You know, I mean, weeping for lost souls is, is a wonderful thing. But, you know, sometimes we weep because of other things, you know, in our life. And I think that God has a special blessing for those who go soul winning, even when they are struggling. In, in areas in their life. And I think that, and you know, there have been times, I'll just be honest with you, there have been times when I did not want to go soul winning at all. I mean, it was the last thing I wanted to do. But I said, you know what, I'm just going to go because I'm trying to be consistent, I'm trying to be faithful, you know. I'm trying to just go uh, consistently, this is the time that I go, and I just, I had a bad attitude in a way. I mean, I just, whatever, let's put in the time, you know, let's get this over with. And good night, I saw people get saved, and I I mean, I saw God's power in some of those times. Because God said, hey, thank you for coming. Thank you for putting me first. Thank you for doing my work, even when it wasn't easy. He said, you know, your attitude might stink. But he said, hey, thank God you did what was right anyway. And he said, I'm going to bless you for that. And, you know, I usually went away. I didn't go away. Uh, well, somebody got saved, but still. Hey, I went away rejoicing. And I got in the car and said, hey, who cares? about that. Uh, who cares about what I'm struggling with? Somebody just got saved! And that's going to make you shout and rejoice. Brother Jimenez, of course, most of you all know Brother Jimenez, but he was telling me, he was, uh, he was at work, and, and he, was, uh, he just finished winning this guy to the Lord, like at the break room, at his job. And uh, he gave him the gospel and went through with him, and he had the Bible, and he went through with him, and the uh, guy got saved, and he was talking to him, and all of a sudden the supervisor walks in. Okay. And he said the supervisor was a really nice guy, and this was very out of character for him. And the supervisor walked in and just kind of had a stern look on his face, pointed at the Bible, and put his finger on the Bible. And he said, so he meant it. How is that such and such assignment coming along? You know, with something that he was supposed to be working on or whatever, and just kind of real mean look and just pointing at the Bible. And Brother Jimenez said, you know, it's very out of character. He's usually a really nice guy. I mean, he's on his break. You know, he's just relaxing in the break room. And uh, so Brother Jimenez kind of looked at him, just kind of puzzled, like he just didn't really know what to say. And he was kind of thinking of what he was going to say, like, uh, you know. And, uh, and this is kind of rare. I mean, this doesn't usually happen. But the guy that he had just wanted to the Lord was kind of an outspoken guy, I guess, just in his character uh, about a lot of things. And uh, that was just, you know, some people were like that. And uh, the guy just shouts out. The guy that he had just wanted the Lord just yelled at he said, who cares about some stupid such and such assignment? I just got saved. <laughs> and and uh, Brother Jimenez was like, whoa. I mean, he was taken aback. He was shocked. But the guy just yelled that out. And then, uh, and then this is what the guy said to the boss. The boss is like, uh, he's like, you mean you weren't religious before? And then, you know, because he doesn't understand what he means by getting saved. And... Uh, the guy says, I was religious, but I was wrong. Because he was, you know, he's a Pentecostal, he's a charismatic. He said, I was wrong. You know, I was religious, but I was wrong. 
And the guy's just like, uh, okay. You know? I thought that was a great story. But you see how things kind of take on a different perspective sometimes, you know. Uh, problems that we have, I mean, they might be big problems, but when it comes to somebody getting saved, that kind of just overshadows anything else that's going on. I mean, it truly does. And so he that goeth forth and weepeth bearing press to see, he might come back rejoicing. No, it says shall doubtless. I mean, even if it just said shall come again with rejoicing, I mean, that would be a promise. Just like whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But I mean, God even chose to insert another word here shall doubt us. I mean, he wants you to know this is not a questionable thing. This is not a doubtful thing. When you talk about being outspoken, it's funny. I was, I was at Soul winning yesterday afternoon and I knock on this guy's door and he, you know, he said he was saved and everything. He went to such and such a church. And he said, well, you know, I'm just one of those quiet Christians. Like, I think he meant referring to the fact that I'm out knocking his door, you know, and preaching the gospel and everything. And so he's kind of justifying himself. I didn't say anything to him, but he's just trying to justify himself why he doesn't do this. He just said, I'm one of those quiet Christians. And, and so I just said, well, I guess that makes me one of the big loudmouths Christians. <laughs> he's like, well, I guess we need those too, you know. Hey, I wish we had more of them. Somebody that would open their mouth boldly and make known the mystery of the gospel. But I thought that was funny. I'm one of those quiet Christians. But uh, look if you would at Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter number 6. And uh, another famous passage, Matthew 6, 31, the Bible reads, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? Now, these are legitimate things. He's not saying, uh, Oh, can we get a new SUV? Oh, man, we need more square footage in our house. Oh, can I please get a new iPod? I mean, these are things that you need, like food and, and uh, raiment. Drink, water, I mean, it's something you've got to have. He says, therefore, take no thought saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or wherewithal shall we do? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Now turn back to Deuteronomy 11. Let me show you what I consider, and, and you know, as I read the book of De Deuteronomy, I consider this the Old Testament version of Matthew 6.33. You know that famous verse, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Deuteronomy 11, I believe, teaches the same concept in the Old Testament. And what God's trying to say is, look, if you want to just get all wrapped up in your finances, you want to get all wrapped up in your meal planning, you want to get all wrapped up in your food, your clothes, your house, your car, your, your job, your friends, your family. He's saying there's really just going to be no end to it. You better seek first the kingdom of God and realize that God knows what you need and God can give you what you need. But look at Deuteronomy 11, verse 10. And I love this passage. It's one of my favorite passages in the book of Deuteronomy. But it says in Deuteronomy 11:10, 10, For the land whither thou goest in to possess it is not as the land of Egypt, from whence you came out, where thou sowest thy seed and waterest it with thy foot as a garden of herbs. Now, he's saying here, you're going to the promised land. It's not going to be the same in the promised land as it was in Egypt. Now, Egypt represents worldliness, living in the world. Now, you can still be saved. You've applied the blood to the doorpost, uh, you know, symbolically, as they did in uh, Exodus chapter 12. You've applied the blood. I mean, you've been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, but you haven't necessarily crossed the Red Sea and gotten away, you know, separated yourself from worldliness in the world. Some Christians are still living in Egypt. And some Christians who've left Egypt, they say, hey, let's make a captain and let's go back to Egypt. Remember, uh, Brother Jimenez preached on that last time he was here. And so we see here that uh, he's saying, look, the way that you lived in Egypt where you go out, you sow your seed, you water it, you reap it, you take care of it. He's saying things are going to be a little different in the promised land. In verse 11 he says, But the land whither you go to possess it is a land of hills and valleys and drinketh water of the rain of heaven, a land which the Lord thy God careth for. You see, now he's taking care of your needs. Not, i got to go out and do everything myself. God's saying, I'm taking care of the land. I'm going to watch it. He says... God's going to care for it. The eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it from the beginning of the year even unto the end of the year. Verse 13. And it shall come to pass 